The ending of Assassin's Creed Valhalla is intertwined with the lore of the first civilization and the events that took place in the Isu era, making it very difficult to grasp the meaning of the visions Eivor experiences in Valhalla and how it all links back to the beginning of time, or more accurately, 77,000 years ago. Whilst we unravel the meaning behind the story of Valhalla, it is crucial that you keep in mind that Eivor's visions of Asgard and Jotunheim are a window into events that took place in the Isu world, viewed in the eyes of a person who could not possibly comprehend the reality and advancement of the first civilization. As a result, Eivor lives through these memories in the lens of a Norseman, as that is Eivor's sole means of making sense of the visions. Before delving into Eivor's visions and what they represent, we must first go back to the beginning to provide context to what's to come. The Isu are ancient, highly advanced beings who existed long before humans inhabited the planet. The Isu were represented by three beings named Juno, Minerva and Jupiter. It is clear that although highly advanced, they were not gods, as stated by Minerva herself when the question was proposed by Ezio. You are... gods. <laughs> no, not gods. We simply came before. At a point in time, the Isu and humans coexisted, and they partook in a war that spanned 10 years. During this war, the Isu discovered that there was an impending doom threatening their existence, a solar flare that would wipe out the first civilization. To counteract the catastrophe, the Isu proposed six solutions, one being the construction of a tower that would act as a shield to humanity, minimizing the effects of the solar flare on the planet. This proved ineffective, and the Isu had to look towards other ways of preserving their existence. They were quick to realize that no solution could stop the inevitable end, and instead, they began to explore the idea of living through the catastrophe rather than preventing it entirely, thus creating the SAGE program. Being able to survive the catastrophe would also allow the Isu to help prevent future world-ending events by passing on their knowledge and technology to future beings. The SAGE program allowed the Isu to reincarnate themselves and be reborn into new bodies, allowing their consciousness to live on past the disaster. Sages are born with their own personalities and memories, however, they also possess the memories of their past self. The duality of their personality and memories sometimes works harmoniously, as seen with Aita, an Isu scientist and the husband of Juno, who had been reincarnated many times throughout history. Whilst at other times, the two sides of a sage, the one linked to their former self and their newly born independent self, can clash with one another. An example of such will be shown at a later time. The visions that Eivor experiences through the eyes of the Norse god Odin take place in Asgard and Jotunheim. The locations and characters presented are shown as we currently know them. If you're knowledgeable in Norse mythology, then everything will seem familiar to you. The reality of this world subverts our understanding of the established law and pulls back the curtains to reveal that what we know as Norse mythology is in reality a part of Isu history. Before the collapse of the first civilization, eight important Isu figures enter the Sage program in order to reincarnate themselves and live among those in the new world. We later meet these sages as their new self. Odin becomes Eivor, Tyr is Sigurd, Thor as Halfdan and Svala as Freya. Odin makes it abundantly clear that Loki is not to be included in the use of the Sage program, or as he refers to it, the Life Tree, as he believes that Loki would only bring harm to humanity and has nothing of value to present to the new world. Nonetheless, Loki, living up to his reputation as a cunning trickster, sneaks his way to the Sage program, kills Heimdall, and takes his place to reincarnate himself as the assassin we now know as Bassin. Knowing this information brings clarity to the visions that come to Ava. It makes sense of Odin's appearance in Eivor's consciousness, whenever he is placed in a moral position and has to make a choice. The visions are the memories of his former self, Odin, and Odin's appearance in his mind is the conflicts previously mentioned, where both sides of his being are clashing. Odin encourages Eivor's selfish and glory-driven side. He is seen meddling with Eivor's consciousness and swaying his morality through every important decision Eivor is faced with. The alternate side of Eivor's personality is manifested in the player's choice. Do you give in to Odin's influence or fight back against his evil nature? In Eivor's first psychedelic trip to Asgard, an Isu event is shown to us through a Norse lens, from the perspective of Odin, who is also mentioned by his alternate name, Harvey, which translates to the One. We see Loki sneak his wolf son Fenrir from Jotunheim into Asgard, as he feared that he would be at risk in Jotunheim. 
Odin is enraged when he discovers this, and imprisons the wolf Fenrir. This is to prevent his foretold fate, that he would die at the hands of a wolf, in the Battle of Ragnarok, from becoming reality. It is shown that Odin has completely banished the existence of wolves in his realm, further evidencing his struggle regarding coming to terms with his fate. The second key event that takes place in this vision is the introduction of the Builder, a man who promises to build a magic infused tower that would prevent the inevitable Ragnarok from destroying Asgard. Are you starting to see the similarity between the Isu and Norse mythology? The Builder and the Tower represents one of the six solutions that was mentioned earlier, where the Isu attempted to build a tower that would shield them from the Solar Flare, or as called by the Norse, Ragnarok. As pointed out in Isu lore, the tower does not come to fruition, and Odin looks for an alternate method of salvation. The second vision tells the story of the Sage program, of course once again through the lens of Norse mythology. Odin visits Jotunheim on a quest to acquire a magical mead that would allow him to transfer his consciousness into another being, one that would live through Ragnarok. Whilst in Jotunheim, Odin meets Gunloader, an ice giantess, the daughter of the king of Jotunheim, Sotunga. She lives a secluded life and focuses all her time on observing a crystal glass, which presents all possible futures. She mentions that every outcome she has viewed leads to Ragnarok. Gunloader also states that within the crystal glass, she hears the voices of those who came after, referring to humans in the future. She also says, I leave them words, little packets of possibility, waiting for unknown ears, many ages hence. From her statement, it can be theorised that Gunloader represents one of the Isu beings that we've seen communicate with the future one that had spoken to Ezio Adatore himself, as further supported by the mysterious Ezio-like voice that responds in the crystal glass, saying, Who are you? Who are you? Odin, with the help of a Jotun named Hurricane, acquires the mean necessary to complete the incarnation ritual. Odin and Hurricane meet in a cave. Hurricane is seen holding the Apple of Eden, which she quickly conceals when Odin arrives. Before concealing it, she says the following line, The probabilities lead us here. The calculations give us hope. This exact statement is said by Juno when Eivor acquires the Apple of Eden in Vinland, the place where Connor Kenway retrieves it in the future. The probabilities lead us here. The calculations give us hope. This marks the first clue that Hurricane represents Juno in the vision. Back in the cave, the all-knowing Mimir is present and tells Odin that for the mead to become magical, he must infuse it with the sacred waters of Mimir's well. In addition to presenting the blood of an Aesir, meaning that Odin must sacrifice a part of himself to the ritual, Odin proceeds to remove his own eye and present it to the sacred waters that nourish the world tree. This concludes the concoction needed for the ritual. Odin asks Hurricane what sacrifice she is willing to make, in which she responds, My liberty. Sotungur and Gunlother will not forgive this trespass. They will hunt me now to the edges of the Nine Worlds. She also states that herself, Sotungur and Gunlother rule together as father, mother and the sacred voice. The statement solidifies that Hurricane is the Norse representation of Juno. Satunga represents Jupiter, and Gunloader represents Minerva. Juno's story is parallel to that of Hurricane. Hurricane speaks of sacrificing her liberty, and her husband sacrificing his body for knowledge. This refers to the story of Juno and her husband, Aita. As mentioned previously, Aita was a scientist who volunteered to participate in his wife Juno's experiment to transfer his consciousness into an artificial body. The attempt failed, placing Juno in the difficult position of euthanizing her own husband, as the result of the experiment left him trapped in a bristle body, unable to live in good health. Juno preserved Aita's genetic material, making him immortal through continuous reincarnations over the course of human existence. At that time, the Isu were not planning on using incarnation, as they feared it would change humans for the worse. Therefore, seeing Juno's actions as treacherous, the Isu imprisoned Juno in a digital realm within the Grand Temple, where she spent many years reaching out to other humans in an effort to be freed. This was Juno's sacrifice, her liberty taken away, exactly how Hurricane explains. In the third and final vision, Odin returns to Asgard to find that Fenrir, Loki's son, had grown in size at an alarming rate. To ensure that the wolf remains restrained, Odin entrusts the dwarf Ivaldi to manufacture a magical leash with the ability to restrain Fenrir. Ivaldi requests Odin to provide him with a secret that only he would know due to his vast wisdom. The peculiar options presented for the player to choose, humans will survive Ragnarok, 
While this is true in Norse mythology, it is in fact referring to the humans that will survive the devastating effects of the solar flare, which ended the first civilization. Odin attempts to trick Fenrir into wearing the leash by assuring him that its sole purpose is to track where he roams, a way of finding him if needed. Fenrir is suspicious of Odin's intentions, that is until Tyr strikes a deal with the beast. He places his arm in Fenrir's mouth as a pledge of faith. He states that if he is to be found lying about the leash, Fenrir may take his arm. Fenrir agrees to this and waits nervously for Odin to wrap the leash around his neck. The leash begins to inflict pain upon Fenrir. In retaliation, he bites off Tyr's arm and a fight with Odin ensues. Fenrir is once again restrained, however Odin does not slay the wolf as he had previously sworn an oath to never kill him. This scene mirrors the story of Sigurd, who is after all, Tyr reincarnated. In search of his destiny, Sigurd is captured by the paladin Fulke. He is tortured to the point of losing his arm. Although his story does not play out like Tyr's, it is a reaffirmation that fate cannot be unwoven, and one must accept their destiny, as it will take its course no matter what. Tyr reincarnated himself to live through millennia, and yet his written fate came true once again, as he lost his arm for the second time. The struggle to accept fate is a key theme within Valhalla, and it's proven time and time again that it cannot be changed. Similar to Odin's betrayal of Tyr, when he proceeds to use the leash on Fenrir, knowing that it will cost Tyr his arm, Eivor faces a similar fate, when he is told that he will betray his brother Sigurd. Although this does not happen in a conventional manner, it does indeed come true, as Eivor reflects on his journey to realise that he had robbed Sigurd of his dreams, his glory, and even Valhalla. The final scene in Eivor's vision is that of the collapse of the first civilization, or as Eivor sees it, the arrival of Ragnarok. We see Odin and his companions gather around the life tree and drink the magical mead in order to pass on their consciousness before leaving for the final battle that would lead them to their doom. This is parallel to the Isu entering the Sage program to survive the great catastrophe. The life tree is the program and the mead is the advanced technology they use. You can also see Aita at the table amongst the others as well as Loki sneaking into the room at the beginning. Throughout Sigurd's warpath to conquer England, he constantly experiences visions of grandeur, leading him to Valhalla a place he at the time thought was his destiny. The visions become clearer through Fulke's brutal torturing of Sigurd. Odin appears to align himself with Fulke's results, implying that Sigurd had found his true calling. This is because Fulke's brutal methods of torture forces the human consciousness to deteriorate, allowing the Isu within to take control of the body and be reincarnated. The visions experienced by Sigurd are revealed to be Tyr's memories. These visions eventually lead Sigurd and Eivor to a hidden vault. Sigurd uses the memories of his past life as Tyr to speak the words that would unlock the vault and reveal the Norse Tree of Life. In reality, this is not the Tree of Life. It is a machine built by the Isu to transfer the user's consciousness into a digitally constructed simulation, a desperate last resort to outlive the Great Catastrophe. Valka's mother, Svala, is seen using the machine, revealing that before she passed away, she chose to live in the simulation. This is likely due to Svala spending her final years in bad health, opting to live on in the simulation instead. Eivor and Sigurd enter the simulation and find themselves in Valhalla, believed to be a warrior's end. At first they are fooled into thinking this was the real Valhalla, until Eivor sees his father on the battlefield. Varin died a coward, and therefore in Norse belief, it should not be possible to find him in Valhalla, setting off Eivor's suspicions of the place. He discovers that it is a simulation and persuades Sigurd to leave with him. Odin confronts Eivor and attempts to stop him from leaving. This is presented as a physical battle with Odin, although in reality, Eivor is fighting back against his former self's thoughts and influence. The part of Eivor that is influenced by him being a sage, values glory and power, and Eivor is seen coming to terms with the fact that he does not need this in life to be content. He fights back against Odin's influence and severs the ties he once had with his former self, becoming fully independent of Odin and forging his own path. He does this by releasing his axe, breaking free of Odin's control. When a warrior dies, an axe is placed in their hand, and they are guided to Valhalla. By shattering this bond with Odin, Eivor is truly free. Once Eivor and Sigurd escape the vault, it is revealed that Basim is a traitor, and has tracked them down to this location. As mentioned before, Basim is the incarnation of Loki, and this makes sense of a previous conversation between Eivor and Basim. During that conversation, Basim opens up about his deceased son, who is mistreated and vows to take revenge on those who have wronged him. At the time, we assume that Basim is speaking of something that that had happened to his son in the 9th century, when in reality, he was telling the story of Odin mistreating his son back when the first civilization
civilization existed. Relating back to the visions of Odin and Fenrir, Basim's understanding and clear memories of his former self Loki convey that the connection between a sage and the newborn version of themselves can differ greatly. Basim stays close with Eivor and Sigurd throughout their journey, keeping his purpose a mystery. However, the entire time, he is in search of the Mad One, Odin. To his surprise, it turns out to be Eivor all along. A duel ensues between the two, and as they fight, Basim makes a remark about the wolf bite on Eivor's neck pointing out the irony of it all, considering Odin's fate. Basim is bested in the battle, and Eivor connects him to the simulation, trapping Basim in a digital realm for a thousand years. From within the simulation, Basim delivers a message to Layla and her companions, Sean Hastings and Rebecca Crane, informing them that there is another impending doom awaiting them. Similar to the one Desmond prevented in 2012, Basim states that to prevent the end of humanity, they must seek the Wolfkist, the Mad One and himself. This is of course referring to Eivor as well as Bersim. The prevention of the coronal mass ejection by Desmond was the cause of this new impending doom. This is due to Desmond using the global Aurora Borealis device as a way of shielding the planet. This device has now been active for 8 years, causing the Aurora Borealis to intensify and cause another world ending catastrophe. The warning given by Bersim drives Layla to find Eivor's body and enter the Animus to experience his memories. Doing so leads Layla back to the hidden vault where Bersim is trapped. While Whilst exploring the vault, she gets attached to the simulation device, and as she ascends into the simulation, she drops the Staff of Hermes, which she had previously acquired. Inside the digital space, Layla is greeted by Bersim, who has spent the last thousand or so years alongside a person called the Reader, studying the calculations that would prevent the doom of humanity. Bersim teaches Layla how to slow down the Aurora Borealis device in order to maintain the shield it provides for the protection of the Earth, while slowing it down just enough that it wouldn't become a threat within itself. Following his interaction with Layla, Bersim leaves the simulation and re-enters the real world. He couldn't have possibly done this prior to Layla's arrival as his physical body is long dead. But with the Staff of Hermes being present, Bersim could exit the simulation and depend on the Staff to revitalise his decomposed body and bring him back to his prime form. Bersim appears to miraculously fall onto the Staff after being released by the Yisu device. Although this seems coincidental, that he somehow knew that Layla would drop the Staff in the exact spot that his aged body would fall. This is entirely possible, as he has spent a millennia studying all probabilities of past, present and future. This plan works flawlessly, and Bersim is once again awakened in a new world, the modern world. It is then revealed that the mind of an Isu figure named Aletheia has lived inside the Staff of Hermes for centuries, awaiting this one moment to be reunited with her lover, Loki. Aletheia was Loki's lover during the first civilization. She was struck by a deadly illness and urgently needed the help of Odin to survive. Whilst completing the Animus Anomalies, you can hear Aletheia begging Loki to seek Odin's help to allow her to be included in the Sage program as a way of living through her illness. Loki informs her that it's a pointless ask, as he is certain that Odin would not grant him this favour. And I will sooner see our world obliterated before I gave that man a view of me on my knees. This is likely due to Aletheia being someone who is the personification of truth and is in opposition of those who embrace divine status and hold themselves above others. A mindset as such can create many enemies in Isu society, as the Isu are generally known and defined by their human slave practices. In the off chance that you may have missed this, Aletheia is present in the vision of Jotunheim as Angboda, the Jotun who interrogates Odin to reveal what he plans on doing with her and Loki's son Fenrir. Following Odin's refusal to help Aletheia, Loki tries transfers her mind into the Staff of Hermes as a last resort to prevent her death, leading to the current timeline of Loki and Aletheia reuniting via a meticulous plan to use Layla as a way of freeing themselves while simultaneously saving the world. With Bersim's escape, Layla remains in the Grey, the digital plane of existence that Juno occupied after she was freed from the Grand Temple. In this realm, Layla stumbles upon a mysterious figure, a silhouette of a man with a very familiar voice. It is revealed that since his sacrifice to save the world, Desmond Miles has been living in the Grey as the Reader. For the past eight years, Desmond's purpose has been to read the calculations of all the possible outcomes, in search of a reality where the catastrophe never struck. Desmond explains that all outcomes examined thus far have led to the 
great catastrophe taking place, Layla proposes an alternate method, which entails searching for a reality where the catastrophe did happen and those remaining few who survived found a way to break the cycle and prevent the catastrophe from reoccurring. This method was originally suggested by Minerva, who Desmond rejected when he took the side of Juno. Layla is informed by Desmond that her physical body is being exposed to a lethal amount of radiation released by activating the pedestal, and without her staff, she will succumb to her death very shortly. Layla comes to terms with her passing and stays behind with Desmond to search for a solution. In the end, Bersam is seen at the cabin that Layla and her companions had set up camp. Whilst roaming around the environment, you may encounter a squirrel. This could be a subtle reference to Ratatosk, a squirrel from Norse mythology, who runs up and down Yggdrasil to carry messages between the eagle at the top and the serpent Nathogra at the base. Bersam joins up with Rebecca and Sean, under the disguise of being an assassin who is here to aid them. His intentions are ambiguous and it is not made clear whether he's a good or a bad person. We know that he has done harmful acts, however his actions for the most part have been justified, as throughout Valhalla, Odin is seen mistreating Loki, Aletheia and their son Fenrir. Loki is neglected by Odin and is disallowed to use the Sage program. These mistreatments likely stem from Loki being a misfit. In the Norse world, Loki is half giant and this is partially why he's looked down on by the Aesir. It is plausible that this translates in the world of the Isu as Loki being part of a lower caste, and as mentioned before, the Isu are known for their embracement of divine status and likely have no regard or empathy for those lesser than them. We know that social classes exist in the Isu society, as Juno is described as being part of the Illuminate class. This is why Loki and Aletheia hid their child, as their child is a product of a relationship between two different classes. Finally, Bessem requests to meet with the head of the assassins, William Miles, Desmond's father. What he plans to do with William can only be speculated, as the story is yet to be continued. Another reason also exists as to why Basim initially thought that Sigurd was the Mad One Odin and not Eivor. This is because Eivor is actually a female. The name Eivor itself is a female Nordic name. Another point that reinforces this theory is that when letting the animus decide the gender of the character, the female model is picked for the Conquest of England narrative and the male Eivor is picked for the Asgardian story. The male model for Eivor was originally the model for a young Odin. This was a key oversight from Basim, who chased the wrong person for the majority of the time in England. Darby McDevitt, the lead writer of Valhalla, also stated that the option to let the animus decide is there for people who want the exact story of how it happened. Eivor is also referred to as Varen's daughter in a letter from Reeve Goodwin to King Alfred, which translates to Varen's daughter. Finally, when Bersin begins to suffer from the bleeding effect caused by using Layla's primitive animus, he witnesses Eivor sitting around the campfire. In this scene, Eivor is always female, further confirming the gender of the character. The prequel story to Valhalla also chooses to portray Eivor as a female. Although this is all mere speculation, and Ubisoft have confirmed both genders to be canon, it is safe to assume that female Eivor was the original protagonist of the game, and the mere presence of Odin within her mind glitched the animus into two data streams, allowing Layla to pick and choose at will. It also adds more depth as to why Bersim never suspected Eivor the Wolfkist once until the very end of the game. Once all the members of the Order of Ancients are eliminated, Eivor receives a letter by a person naming themselves Poor Fellow Soldier of Christ. Eivor is asked to meet with the mystery person in exchange for information on the leader of the cultists, the Grand Magister himself. Once Eivor arrives at the meeting location, he is met with King Alfred, who had been overthrown as a king and now lives in a humble secluded village, baking bread of all things. Alfred reveals that he had been the leader of the cult all along, and had been feeding Eivor information on their identities and locations the entire time. Alfred explains that he detested the cult and opposed their beliefs and ideals. Having been forced into the title of Grand Magister due to the death of his brother, he seized the opportunity to rid the world of the cult. By destroying the order from within, Eivor was the perfect piece of the puzzle for Alfred's plan and therefore used him to vanquish the cult. As a way of repaying Eivor for his troubles, Alfred grants Eivor access to his observatory located within the Old Minster. Before leaving to explore Alfred's study room, Eivor is told that with the Order of Ancients coming to an end, Another one must take its place. A universal divine order, inspired by God for the betterment of man. 
Exploring Alfred's study room, his grand idea for a new order is expanded upon and his ideologies further explained, revealing why he hated the cult and what he would do differently when creating a new order. The first letter found in his study shows the thought process that led to Alfred utilising Eivor in order to defeat the cult, revealing that spies had spotted him in Ravensthorpe, working with the Hidden One Hytham. This prompted the idea to send letters to Hytham about the cult, being fully aware that the information would be passed on to Eivor. Alfred is conveyed as a strong believer and a committed Christian, and a second note left behind in his study explains his contentment towards the Order. In the second note, it is theorised that a pious defender of Christ's word, named Charlemagne, was coincidentally found dead a week after being warned of the corruption of the Order, implying that the cult may have ordered the man's death to conceal their corruption from the general public. Alfred disagrees with the Order's methods of hiding its motives by using Christianity as a front to their blasphemous goals. The Order of Ancients view human Humanity is inherently evil and corrupt, yet contradict themselves by basing their entire belief system on worshipping the Isu, who inhabited no shortage of evil or corruption. Their blind belief disallowed them to expand their vision to see outside their own hierarchy. The Order's beliefs were those of the Nicene Creed. It adopted key tenets of Christianity, however believed that mankind was not created by one God, but was created by the Isu instead, and therefore refused the message of Christ. The letter presents that Alfred agrees with some aspects of the cult such as the necessity for order if humanity is expected to live peacefully and thrive. However, their methods do not align with his own, as Alfred believes that there is only one true God, and in him his new order will place their faith. Throughout the entire Assassin's Creed saga, we unknowingly watch the new order that Alfred speaks of come to life. This order is known to us as the Templar Order. Yes, King Alfred birthed the Templar Order, the ones that assassins have been at war with for centuries, and Eivor unconsciously played a pivotal role in the Templar Order's inception, resulting in you, the player, being at fault for the creation of an order that you fight to destroy as various assassins throughout history. Just as the Order of Ancients ended, so did the Hidden Ones. When Bayek founded the Hidden Ones, he wanted them to remain anonymous, seeking no glory and recording no history of their actions, existing as a silent blade that spilt blood in the name of peace. The Hidden Ones, in his eyes, existed to serve the greater good, with no rewards or accolades attributed to their achievements. A letter from Bayek to his lover Aya can be found in the story. Within this letter, Bayek speaks of the Magus Codex, which references Aya as one of the founders of the Hidden Ones. The Magus Codex was a journal which belonged to Magus, this Hidden One was stationed in the Egyptian branch of the Order. It was written to keep a record of the Hidden One's final assembly, which was supervised by Amunet, also known as Aya. The topic of this assembly was about the Creed and its many ironies. Bayek disapproved of having her name recorded in this journal, as it goes against the idea of the Brotherhood and how they solely exist to seek justice, and shunned any ideas of fame and glory. Not to mention that having the name of a key founder listed in the Codex could draw unwanted attention and lead to Aya being hunted. Upon discovering the Codex, Bayek instructs Aya to destroy the pages, to erase any reference of the Hidden Ones from this world, and any evidence of dissent amongst the Hidden Ones. Bayek is aware that this request is unreasonable, as few can keep such a secret concealed. If they fail to destroy the Codex, which they ultimately did, Bayek states that they will have failed in the name of righteousness. The Codex was never destroyed, and if it was, its many pages were either recreated or scattered across the world at various points in history. Bayek's vision of the Hidden Ones died with him. Many years in the future, a brotherhood existed in the Levant. This brotherhood founded their own sovereign state in 1090. Under Hassan Sabah, the brotherhood had been reformed as the Order of Assassins. Altair would be part of this brotherhood of assassins, known as the Levantine Brotherhood. This was the first moment in history where the existence of assassins was recorded. They were also much more public and recognised than any other branch of assassins at the time. Eventually, Altair would take leadership of the Assassin's Order. He would greatly influence the Order of Assassins by doing away with the laws of old and introducing new rules and techniques to the Brotherhood. The reformations that took place were inspired by the knowledge he gained from the Apple of Eden. The Levantine Brotherhood would go to spread its message and teachings across the world, establishing the Assassins as a global order. The influence of the Levantine Brotherhood would ripple through the many generations of Assassins who came after. This new creed flew in the face of what Bayek wanted as with the death of the Hidden Ones came the birth of the Assassin's Creed. Where other men blindly follow the truth, remember... Nothing is true. Where other men are limited by morality or law, remember... 
Everything is permitted. We work in the dark to serve the light. We are assassins. You do not understand the true meaning of the phrase, my child. It does not grant you the freedom to do as you wish. It is a knowledge meant to guide your senses. It expects a wisdom you clearly lack. They desire the secrets locked away in Altair's library. Secrets they believe will lead them to something called the Grand Temple. You have shown great conviction, strength, courage. Is this not why you fight? To protect your people? Let me tell you something, Kana. Life is not a fairy tale, and there are no happy endings. In your haste to save the world, boy, take care you don't destroy it. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. To say that nothing is true is to realize that the foundations of society are fragile and that we must be the shepherds of our own civilization. To say that everything is permitted is to understand that we are the architects of our actions and that we must live with our consequences, whether glorious or tragic. <laughs>